Hi. <laughs> Welcome to the Workforce and Economic Development Subcommittee. It's December 3rd, 2019. I will be calling this meeting to order. I do not have any cards to call to the public. All right, minutes of the meetings. Is there a motion? So moved to approve. Second. There's a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes. Uh, discussion and possible action items. Anybody need anything from this area? Nope. No? Are you sure? What? I thought we wanted to go to consent. No, we don't. It's just discussion and action. Do you want anything? Well, There's I nothing. To, I thought we were going to take like each item. Oh, okay. Yeah, you see what I'm saying? I, I got it. Okay. I just okay. got it. Sorry. You're right. There is no consent. And right, I'm so still, I'm moving with time. consent. I, uh, okay. <laughs> item number two, 2020 Hold state on. and federal legislative agendas. Yes, we know. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Madam Chair, committee members. Um, this morning we are presenting the portions of the legislative agenda that impacts um, this committee. And um, I'm Frank McCune, Director of Government Relations, and with me today is Yesenia Dote, uh, Manager of State Relations, and Clark Penzel, Manager of Federal Relations. Each year in September, Government Relations reaches out to the city departments to build the legislative agenda, which is based upon the issues um, that may be discussed during the legislative process or to even gather potential legislative ideas. We combine that information and then brief each council member and the mayor for their perspective on the items, as well as learn about other issues that may be of interest to you. From there, we compile the draft legislative agenda, and today we present the items relevant to this subcommittee. For both the state and federal legislative processes, we have used a set of guiding principles to help us filter the legislation and how we should initially respond. Most items of legislation typically fall into one of these principal categories. And those are, for the state, to preserve shared revenues, opposing unfunded mandates, protecting local authority, and preserving water resources. As you know, and with you guys serving on various committees, we've been in front of other committees and we're presenting to the other committees as well. So today, as a reminder, is just a portion of the agenda that reaches this um, subcommittee and it's a short set of um, priorities for the subcommittee. So Yesenia will take over the state priorities. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee. Over the past several years, short-term rentals have become popular, but they have also led to unintended consequences for neighborhoods in Phoenix. Issues arise when renters take advantage of the benefits of a residential home, but do not have the same accountability as a long-term renter or an owner. Furthermore, the rise of short-term rentals have re has reduced the availability of housing options and a loss of economic benefits derived from hotels and other tourism revenues. Um, to address some of these concerns, the legislature passed House Bill 2672 this past session, during, um, and while this was a step in the right direction, it did not address all of the local concerns. During this interim, they have had ad hoc committee meetings to try to come up with more solutions to help the local governments address the issues of neighborhoods um, and the cities as well. So staff recommend supporting any efforts that continue to allow um, local regulation of short-term rentals that would address the issues that are brought forth by um, constituents and neighborhoods to city councils. And uh, with regard to this committee, that's the primary item on this one. And then with regard to the federal program, the two guiding principles, oh, I'm sorry, the two guiding principles are promoting fiscal sustainability and protecting local authority, and Clark will run through those focused areas. Madam Chair and subcommittee members, 
Um, the first item will be the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, or the WOA funds. We will continue to support funding that allows for investments for administering, convening, and delivering job-driven services for the administration of federal job training programs throughout the city. These are the programs that the city administers at our Arizona at Work um, facilities. And with that, those are the items that are included in the federal agenda in front of this subcommittee. And so we recommend... We recommend staff, uh, staff recommends approval of these items as focus areas for, from this subcommittee. Anybody have any questions? No? Um, I have a question about the first slide, the homes, the short rent term rentals. Mm -hmm. What does that look like? Because last year uh, there was big issues with the short-term rentals and many communities organized which we did we were the lead in organizing those communities what i heard last year was oh um at least we got it to where we got it where this is baby steps we need to do these things however the impact within i think all our neighborhoods but in specifically the historic neighborhoods uh, we are having more and more issues with the short-term rentals. Uh, prostitution is happening in, in some of them. I've had uh, two shootings within the neighborhoods. Uh, so what is the goal or what is the strategy to really organize and push the short-term rentals? Madam Chair, um, so as I mentioned, this interim, the legislature has held one ad hoc committee meeting, and they're going to be holding at least two more. The first meeting was really focused to address any nuisance and, and noise complaints that have occurred in the neighborhood. And, and I know that the next one is kind of looking at a f focusing on the concentration of large number of, of short-term rentals within neighborhoods. And so at, at the first meeting, it was about a three and a half, four hour meeting, and there was a lot of neighborhood people there and there was a presentation given um, by one of a Phoenix um, neighborhood association and, and some of the concerns that you just raised were brought up and so what has been occurring right now is everyone is working together to to kind of bring forth some of these issues which I know were brought last session but were not addressed and so they're being put on the record and talked about to try to come up with solutions together to address them to give the cities um, an opportunity to be able to address these so right now it's kind of the developing a strategy and working um, to, to listen to what concerns are being brought forth by constituents and neighborhood, and then working from there to develop legislation that can address them. And I believe we're off to a good start because uh, past legislation requires now um, Airbnbs to or short-term rentals to register with the city. And we're also strengthening our noise ordinance um, so if these parties get out of control, the police department can actually find them. Um, so with the registry, I believe that will help us at least start the discussion in enforcement for police. But I know there's a lot that needs to be done and we are pretty well represented by several neighborhoods at the task force. And I just, I know that there's been hearings. I also know that Sedona has yes. written some language. So. I guess my question is, how can the city follow Sedona uh, and be able to move on those items? Um, instead of waiting for the legislature, what, what can we do at the currently and what policy can we put in? Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee, um, as Councilwoman Stark mentioned, it is my understanding the staff is presenting at the next land use and livability subcommittee um, on an ordinance change on some code changes to the city to a put forth the registry um, for short-term rentals which would require that the owner assign somebody or give their contact information of somebody who's available 24 7 when when issues arise and then also to strengthen the city's um, noise 
ordinance so that uh, from a police perspective and from a neighborhood services per perspective, these issues can be addressed um, in a better manner. Yeah, and on top of that, I think they'll have to notice to put some kind of identification on the home itself outside so police and NSD know that it's a, a rental. Yeah. Oh, okay. A short term rental. Yeah, I'm sorry. And what is the definition of short term? Ma Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee, I don't have the definition per state statute of what a short term rental is right in front of me, but I'm happy to get back to you with that. Um, I, I have it, but I just don't have it in front of me right now. Yeah, because I mean, you could define short term as one day. Yeah. So I, I would like to know the what's in the statute in order to then uh, look at it and say maybe we need to change the the definition of what short-term rental is defined as mm -hmm. go ahead can you give us the um <clears throat> the dates of the hearings so we can actually have um individuals from our community testify and maybe we can actually put in our newsletters and stuff also the names of the individuals on that committee so that we can actually start having people lobby those individuals uh, another point is that one of the big things that we're we're having an issue in downtown Phoenix is a lot of the homeless and um, and mentally ill that we have um, in the downtown area and now it's going along into our historic neighborhoods and also along the um, light rail is there any type of state or federal funding that we can actually look for um, one of the biggest problems we're having is um, we have um, these individuals that go and feed the homeless, but at the same time, they don't pick up after themselves. So then it's the city of Phoenix that goes in there and has to basically clean up the mess on a daily basis in, in some of those areas and some of those neighborhoods. Um, so I'm not sure if there's any type of legislation out there that will define on who can give food out, if there's some type of a permit that you need to actually um, have a, a food handler's license um, there's been incidents where um, people have been getting food poisoning by individuals that are trying to feed the homeless but at, at the same time they haven't prepared the food the way that they should prepare it so it it's a, a health issue out there and then the other thing is um, some of our neighborhoods in downtown Phoenix especially around the campus itself I met with two um, two families yesterday, and they're very upset that they have people camping outside of their uh, on the sidewalks and on the streets. And um, what type of laws do we have at the state level and at the county level and the federal level to prevent that and to provide some type of services at the same time? Madam Chair, Councilman, um, to to address the the question about affordable housing and the homeless issue, um, so this past session the legislature appropriated fifteen million dollars to the housing trust fund, and 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 part of that three point five million was designated to be used for housing for individuals who are deemed to be severely mentally ill. Um, and what the Housing Trust Fund is established to do is to provide flexible funding options um, to meet the housing need for low-income families in Arizona. And what the department has done um, is worked on a grant system that, that they collaborate with nonprofits and, and folks that can really take these funds and provide services to address some of the homeless issues and some of the affordable housing issues. Um, and so it is my understanding that there will be an effort to continue funding this upcoming session and also to try to address um, the issues with, with the homeless population. Um, so, so both of those are um, important issues and topics are, are being discussed and that there is going to be legislation next session for. And actually, I think it should be a state issue that it should be a regional approach, more of a state approach instead of um, the city of Phoenix basically providing all the services um, for the Maricopa County that it should be more of a regional approach and how can we start that conversation at the state capitol and maybe then we can bring it down to the county and then um and then to mag also to 
because right now it seems like because we're good stewards and we have all these different programs that we have become the mecca for all homeless um, individuals in the county and now it's becoming for the whole state. And I think it, we should um, share the wealth with um, other cities throughout the state of Arizona. Sharing the wealth? Mm -hmm. Okay, got it. Um, for the short-term rentals, I would like to know the data on how many police officers end up going to short-term rentals and trying to manage neighborhood, uh, I guess, uh, not necessarily dispute, but dialogue, and how many officers were pulling off uh, the streets for these short-term rentals? Because I think we're gonna have to start building, not that we haven't, but really start to build the case. Um, because I think it's critical across our whole city. Some, some neighborhoods don't have that much of an impact because uh, they're further out and it's maybe one and I don't know, but it seems like in the core area, uh, that's where we're really having a lot of challenges. And I believe the Carolyn area as well. There's quite a, a large um, number of uh, short-term rentals in two. Go ahead. I believe it's throughout the whole city. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, and, and Levine in the South Phoenix area, we have um, rental properties that are acres and half acres yeah. and they're having mm. weddings and quinceaneras and and okay. becoming like party houses and I was just wondering that we have restaurants and nightclubs that have capacity of uh, limitation of how many individuals can actually fit in that facility I'm just wondering if there's somehow some way to slip it into a state law that if it's a three bedroom how many individuals are able to 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 live or, or spend the night in that in that house or, or that short-term rental yeah. it might maybe that might be a way for our police officers to enforce that when they go to a, a little house and there's 300 people inside the house and <laughs> in the backyard so I know it's challenging and I think probably this is where you uh, the team needs to get with zoning and neighborhood services uh, there is one uh, example that is live right now uh, in the South uh, Mountain area, and the homes were built uh, purposely. Uh, they're acre homes, two acre homes, uh, purposely for that area, the scenery. And what one of the homes has done is now turned it into a short term rental where they have, I have pictures. Uh, there are cameras all over the neighborhood's property due to the fact to demonstrate. They have to demonstrate. This is where I, I think as a neighbor uh, or a, a constituent, I would get very frustrated with in the sense of uh, they have cameras all over the place and they have to prove that this is happening. Now they have the proof and it now is now taking I want to say six months it's still in the pipe yeah pipeline and nobody can do anything or enforce anything and it is zoned as a residential. as a residential and 300 people are showing up uh, for a wedding. a wedding or a quinceanera or a house party there's pictures demonstrating how they've changed it into a, a venue and uh, there's not adequate, adequate parking in the area. So I think we're all very adamant about making sure we move. Uh, instead of baby steps, we start walking. So yeah. yeah. So um, those are my comments on the short term. Go ahead. Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee, I just wanted to note that the legislation that passed this past session, it does prohibit um, events at short-term rentals. This includes weddings, parties, um, anything of that sort. And so we will um, talk to staff um, as they're developing the ordinance that will be coming forward to council to ensure that those are components that are in there. So for the registration, if a, if a neighbor were to call police and say there's a party and it's deemed that this is a short-term rental because it has been registered as a short-term rental, 
those events can be broken up. Because a lot of the time what has happened previous to this is that somebody goes to a short-term rental who's having a, a wedding or a quinceanera or something of that sort, and the people that are there claim that that is their property, and police has had no way to verify whether that is the case or not. But with the registration that will be adopted um, within the next coming month or so, that will be a tool that will help police to be to be able to um, tell whether that property is a short-term rental and be able to put a stop to those sort of events. So will that be retroactive or, because we have cases right now that are struggling. And so how does that work or does it start uh, this well, particular well, case? Well, it's uh, been four months, they haven't been able to do anything. So another month, so I'll, I'll say January or February, it kicks in. Then do they have to start at that moment, start all over basically and say, okay, we're calling again to say, start our case. I mean, these are the challenges we have. And I want a solution and I'm asking for a solution. So I'm not sure what we can do, but um, you know how I feel about this. <laughs> Is there any other questions? Where you got anything on WIOA? <laughs> okay, thank you. All right, I have to tease them. All right, is there a motion or we don't need a motion? Do we? Yeah, we do. Okay, I need a motion. So move. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Hearing passes, uh, uh, majority well, passes. No. Oh, not the, well, the three. Three. Three say aye. Majority, <laughs> okay, three. motion carries. <laughs> Sheila, I'm sorry. Sheila, come on. Sorry, we're not over. We met, we voted, but sorry. And I had it right here. <laughs> Don't hit me. Okay. <laughs> and um, I'm a former state housing director for the state of Arizona, and I've been doing work in Sedona, actually, with Elliot Pollock. So if you need introductions to staff in Sedona, more than happy to make that happen. Um, I really encourage you to get ahead of this issue because we are talking about uh, nuisances and other things. Um, it is destroying Sedona. They have literally had to close an elementary school because families cannot afford to live in Sedona. And so a lot of it has come from people who may have rented an apartment or turned a bedroom into an apartment and we're getting so much a month, now they can get that much in a weekend. And so it's become a very entrepreneurial situation and one in which uh, Sedona is on the forefront of trying to combat these issues. And um, I'd be more than happy to give staff information and we can um, dialogue about that. The other thing is the $15 million that was mentioned that was passed in the last legislative session, it's already been allocated. So that money's gone. Um, so there is going to be a movement of people trying to get permanent allocation for the trust fund, not a one-time thing every year, because we have, as you've all <laughs> mentioned and been aware of, severe housing challenges, not just for people who are experiencing homelessness, but the workforce and all types of housing to be affordable in our community. So I would encourage the city to also be a part of uh, that effort as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and speaking about uh, affordability, I'm not sure what I was watching this weekend. I don't know. I was watching a documentary or 60 Minutes or something on affordability uh, in Seattle. Yeah, 60 Minutes. Okay, it was 60 Minutes and the challenges that Seattle's having. And uh, I think we, we actually need do need to step ahead. I think we're a little behind because it caught us. Uh, and we are losing affordability within our neighborhoods. And so uh, I think it's, it's, it's a challenge that we, or not a challenge, uh, uh, a task that we ask staff to now start moving around that to, to be able to get some handle on it. Um, so thank you. So item number three, ASU's Knowledge Exchange for Resilience Fellowship Funds. Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the subcommittee. We're here today to talk to you about the opportunity for a staff to participate in a fellowship with grant funding with Arizona State University 
on a, a, a resilient community. So the uh, ASU, uh, guys, first before I do that, I should say with me is my colleague, jo uh, Joe Rizal. He is a program manager in community and economic development, focusing on business attraction for our innovation district and for kind of unique entrepreneurs throughout the entire community. So just as a background, the ASU Knowledge Exchange for Resilience is a program uh, with a mission to build a resilient community. And that's through sharing knowledge and coming up with ways to solve problems together in the community. Uh, one of the items that they had was uh, moved forward with a grant application for a year-long fellowship. Uh, and they did a call to action in uh, uh, October of this year. We did submit for community and economic development and 20 uh, applications for fellows were accepted. We were fortunate enough that Phoenix was one of the applications. It was the only municipal application in the entire state that was selected and Joe was selected to participate in that uh, year long uh, knowledge economy. So of those 20 fellows, uh, our, our proposal was to focus on agriculture technology, but particularly some of the small micro businesses in South Phoenix that do these great farms and, and great products that come out of that area. You'll see a picture of the Arizona worm farm in front of you. Uh, there are several of you in this room that will know that that is my new favorite place in the entire state of Arizona. It is an innovative way to manage the circular economy that they've come up with. The worms eat trash. They produce um, a dirt that our crops are grown in, uh, and it creates this, and they produce food for chickens, and it creates this incredible circular economy that I had to tour. So uh, a really exciting place there. Uh, and it really, for us, for a community economic development, it's an exciting way for us to support kind of how Arizona was founded in agriculture and in farming and that new agri-tech strategy. When we look at our community resilience, you know, we're asked what is a resilient community? It's something that's really gaining national attention, but what it gives the ability to provide is for a community to withstand a shock to the community and continue to thrive. And by that shock, it might be the loss of a job, it might be the loss of a company, it might be a drought, it might be something that changes significantly within the community, but groups have come together to work to be able to allow the area to thrive and move forward. It also supports uh, the council identified 2025 Phoenix Food Action Plan and goals that were approved. And it does that with us. Of course, that's run through the Office of Environmental Programs. But for us, what that allows us to do is to partner with them to support those local businesses and those local businesses that, that uh, support food initiatives and local food initiatives here in Phoenix. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, on the celebration of local diversity in agriculture, it really is how Arizona was founded. Our warehouse district was founded because of agriculture here in the Phoenix area. But most importantly, it creates a resilient food system. So in time of stress or drought or, or global challenges, food, our most basic uh, source, is produced right here in the community. The economic development that comes out of uh, the, the uh, fellowship is the promotion of those local farms. I've had the pleasure over the past few months of touring about 20 local farms here in South Phoenix. And there are some incredible businesses that are growing their own fruits and vegetables. They're producing a product uh, that they then sell to our restaurants. They sell to our hotels. You can pick up, if, if you can believe this, I feel like sometimes I'm in Mayberry. I go into those areas, and it's an honor system. I can go buy a pie right out of a cabinet, and I put my money right into a jar. There's no one watching me. I pick up great foods that are manufactured right here uh, in the Phoenix area, which supports jobs. There are hundreds and hundreds of jobs that are supported in, uh, in the South Phoenix market. It leverages $30,000 in funding support. So as part of the fellowship, we do receive $30,000 that we can use in marketing the food agriculture system and the agri-tech program here and, and really market uh, an agritourism business that we have going here in Phoenix. And it complements other ongoing city efforts, as I mentioned, through our Office of Environmental Services on programs that we have here in Phoenix. On those deliverables, we have very specific items that we have to create. Uh, one is to really look at the 
analysis of what the resilient question here in Phoenix, what does that mean and how are we going to produce a more resilient economy in Arizona for food? Joe will need to participate in a draft uh, article for a peer review journal of which they'll talk about their findings and a one-page summary of the data that comes out of the year-long fellowship. It looks for partnerships in our annual food and farm program that is produced by Local First. Uh, Katie is here with us. Uh, she's sitting somewhere, there she is. Katie from Local First is here. This would be the seventh year of the Arizona Food and Farm Forum. Last year, it was in Gilbert at Agritopia. This year, we have convinced Local First, who are great partners, to host the event in South Phoenix with our farms. So we would come in as a sponsor of that event uh, and truly promoting that resilience in local farming and in, in helping those farmers realize it's not necessarily in their best interest to sell out to home developers or larger scale development. It really is best for the community if they stay and maintain their presence here in, in Arizona. So we are here to the subcommittee asking your authorization uh, to move forward to city council to accept and disperse the $30,000 in grant funds from Arizona State University. And with that, we're happy to take any questions you might have. Well, the project sounds exciting. Uh, one of my questions is because it's talking about sustainability. Has anybody talked to uh, solid waste uh, to figure out uh, ways that uh, we could sustain uh, some of the practices that you are learning, or not, not you, but the fellowship is learning, um, and what ways we can turn that into economic growth? Councilwoman, I'll, I'll have Joe answer that question. We were lucky enough, uh, we actually stole him from the Circular Economy Public Works to come do the work with us here today. So I'll let him talk specifically about that. Yeah, Madam Chair, thank you for the question. Yes, I worked on the Reimagine Phoenix Initiative for a few years and I still have my contacts in Public Works. So I will be bringing in everybody who has been focused on food just to have that larger conversation. And then, of course, working with ASU, who has helped us with applied projects related to food as well. Because I, I'm really curious, um, we're in this debate or conversation, really conversation, about the solid waste and the rate. Uh, and if composting is not part of uh, the future of, of the city, how does then the industry uh, pick that element up or that piece up so that then it's, uh, we can still, uh, there's still the ability to compost, but then how do we, we, the circular economy in the sense of make it so that it helps our farms, helps the worms, obviously, uh, you know, how does this, the cycle all go so that then uh, there is, uh, people have the ability then to take their, their food and take it to somebody and say, here, you can have it. So I don't know if those are conversations uh, that need to be, need to have a dialogue or, or, or be able to uh, start the dialogue or if the dialogue has been going on. But to me, this all should come out of the, the Solid Waste and Sustainability Office to come with some uh, solutions, I guess is what I'm saying. Madam Chair, I think the unique thing about the fellowship is for the first six months, you actually get a chance to delve into the major issues that, that South Phoenix farmers are facing. And it does warrant the opportunity to work with Public Works and Office of Environmental Programs, as well as Local First and other partners to really figure out, okay, how do we look at the food system and try to make it as sustainable as possible? And Madam Chair, you make a great point on looking at that circular economy and the bigger conversation of that composting. And if composting isn't part of the future uh, from our side, how can we continue that composting through the worm farm? How can we continue right. it so that product becomes something else and continues that circular economy? So you make a great point in bringing in public works and others to have that conversation as we identify those large problems oh, and solutions works. for those problems. <laughs> You're right, public works. Um, I think, anybody else have questions? Can you tell me where in South Phoenix uh, the farm is, the worm farm is located? Oh, absolutely, Madam Chair. Um, it is just about uh, 20, I'm gonna get it wrong, but it's right about 20th Avenue in Dobbins. 
So it is just sitting at the foothills of South Mountain. So it's by the T-Bone Steakhouse. It's very close. It has to be by there, mm -hmm. around there, around um, Montavo too. Yeah. It's very close. Okay. Madam Chair, I'll get you the address. If you'd like a tour, uh -huh. it is, it's a definite worth an hour of your time to see something pretty cool going on in South Phoenix. It's unique, something you wouldn't think is, is such an incredible industry. Well, thank you very much for the innovation. Uh, I need a motion. So I will move forward with the recommendation to City Council to approve 30000 in funding. I'll second that. Uh, there's a motion. There's a second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion passes. Thank you. We are on to item four, uh, development agreement with Next Debt. LLC for development of property located at 117, 125, 133, 141 East Jackson Street in downtown Phoenix. Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee, we are here today uh, to talk to you about a project here in the warehouse district that involves a historic warehouse uh, in, in the area and would include the addition of a new hotel. With me today is Pro uh, Deputy Director Zandon Keating, who will walk us through uh, the project that is before us proposed. Zandon? Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, Chris. Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee, uh, to orient you to the site, it is uh, just south of the arena, the Suns Arena. It's um, currently, there's three, there's uh, four parcels there. Three of them are currently vacant. Um, and one of them is that historic building that is also currently vacant as well. Southwest corner of 2nd Street and uh, Jackson Street is the specific location. So to tell you a little bit about the historic building, um, as you can see there, it's the uh, formerly, most formerly the Cooperstown restaurant. Um, and it's uh, the WP Fuller um, paint warehouse. Uh, currently vacant, needs a lot of work to rehabilitate it and bring it up to uh, today's standard so it can be used um, in an economically beneficial um, fashion. There's a number of things that, that need to occur to, uh, to rehabilitate it. New roof is one of those things. There's a lot of paint removal that's going to need to take place really to bring it back to that original facade. There's some pretty significant structural repair that, that needs to uh, occur within the building. There's other things such as window replacement, um, door replacement to bring it back to that, that original flare. All in, it's a, we think it's about $1.4 million worth of renovations. So a pretty significant amount of um, funds to really bring it um, up to standard. So obviously that's, that's been a little bit difficult for developers to figure out how to make that work. Um, and luckily today we now have somebody who's come forward and they have a plan and, and um, they, they're hoping to make this work. So our, the group that we're working with is the Anish Hotel Group. Um, they are a, uh, a group that has a, about 15 different properties. They've worked either on the development side or uh, the management side of, of uh, about 15 different hotels. Primarily in Oklahoma and Missouri is, is where their, their base is, but they've, they've done some other stuff and they're really interested in now developing in downtown Phoenix and, and bringing um, their partnership here. Give you an idea of some of the, the brands that they've worked with, you'll notice a, a number of um, national brands that, uh, that they've worked with. A number of them are already here in downtown Phoenix. Um, and right now they have a, a concept that they're hoping to bring here. This is a home to suites um, hotel that they're hoping to bring to this particular site. So give you a little, a couple things about the project to be um, approximately six stories is um, what's proposed. About 140 hotel rooms is um, what they're thinking will work. Um, for parking, they are including some parking with the site, about 23 spaces. They believe that that should be enough to um, serve the needs of, of the hotel. Um, and then most importantly, renovation and reactivation of the hotel and their plan for, or the, of the historic building. And their plan for that building is for it to be the lobby and amenity space for, for the actual hotel. So they'll have um, some sort of food and beverage option in there um, and then all of that, that lobby space. So there, it should be, the plan is it, it's going to be a really cool space, a really cool addition um, to, to this hotel here. So with that, 
uh, staff has been working towards an agreement for a, a government property lease excise tax, um, and which would include uh, eight years of abatement um, for, for that hotel. Some of the benefits that would come out of this project, um, obviously there's a $21 million investment in downtown Phoenix. Um, new tax revenue is fairly significant um, associated with the project. Um, staff projects approximately 175,000 in construction sales tax, and then uh, 270,000 in um, annual hotel tax um, once the, the site is um, stabilized. Um, reactivation of that historic building, of course, and then there's a number of jobs associated with it, both construction and permanent jobs that would be associated with the project. And with that, we um, are asking for your the subcommittee's recommendation for uh, council approval of the development agreement. So we're available for any questions. I have a question to the representative of the hotel. <laughs> you can move a slide. Which one more. Is it possible? I, you would have to talk to your client, but where the historic. Uh, building is right there. Is it possible to, to do a different type of signage or it's just that's a, such a pretty building <laughs> and I just <laughs> you know Nick you can work your magic but I just think that's such a pretty building and, and to see maybe if they could uh, maybe is that light or is it painted on there? Madam Chair, members of the committee, subcommittee, um, Nick Woodson, Woman One Arizona Center, representing Anish. Um, I don't think a decision has really been made as to the type of signage that will go on there, and I agree with you. It's, it doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, but but we'll work on that. Yeah, I just I just think it's a pretty building, and it, it would is. be nice to have a a beautiful sign. Yeah, I, I agree. In fact, we'll have to work with. Um, Kevin waits here, but we'll have to work with he and Michelle on whatever signage goes on the building anyway. So, so I think we'll be working on that together. Yeah, the Lucents and the Kelvins and everything else. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Anybody else have a question? I have a question for Nick. So Nick, you all met with um, Phoenix Union High School and the um, Phoenix Elementary School? Yes. And then you guys worked out? Yeah, what, we, what we've done with really all of the giplets that we've done downtown, and we've done a lot of them, um, there's a a deficiency between the amount of equalization payments that the school districts received during the term of a GPLIT and, uh, and what they would otherwise have received but for the GPLIT. So we make a, a contribution, a donation, um, each year during the eight years to the respective school districts to cover that deficiency. It's not a lot. It's usually about $15,000 a year per school district. In fact, Phoenix Union, I think, is even much less than that. Um, so it's not a lot, but it's it's, it's something that we do. Again, it's a, it's a it's a contribution, a donation. It's 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 not a quid pro quo or anything. And then the other thing is, um, <laughs> you seeing that it's a historic building, you're bringing it back to its original look, right? So that's repairing the roof, removing some of the paint that's on the bricks right now, and and basically bringing it back to. Yeah, Madam Chair, Councilman Nowakowski, um, there is a slide, I think it was one of the earlier slides. Yep. Um, yeah. If you take a look at just the roof itself, you can see that it's just full of holes. Um, right. one, one back, please, I think, the aerial. Yeah, see, this is all just, it's awful. You can go in there and see, you know, light coming through it and everything else. So it's in really poor shape. So, yes, we'll be bringing it back uh, to its, its original condition and hopefully even better thank you so much and with that I'd like to make a motion to approve staff's recommendation second there's a motion and a second all those in favor if you say aye aye, aye. motion carries thank you no. oh there's one no <laughs> yeah but I mean they got that <laughs> don't worry we're recording it <laughs> but Jim if you want to say no I'll let you <laughs> item <Why>? five <laughs> Okay, three. He wants to be heard. Yeas be heard. and one no. <laughs> Five, update on the downtown development request for proposals process. Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee, we are back before you today 
uh, on an item that came out of this subcommittee earlier this year in which you asked our team to go back and look at our process by which private properties can come into the city asking for assistance, whether it's in a laydown area, whether it's in a, a streets program, whether it's in a sidewalk, or whether it is uh, seeking a giplet, as we just saw with our previous, uh, previous item. Currently, uh, our private properties come in through the same process that we have come through with our uh, city-owned properties. They come in through a request for proposal. Uh, and this subcommittee asked us to go back and see if there was some efficiencies to be gained through a different process. With me today, again, Zan and Keating, who will go through uh, some of the ideas that we've been researching this past year. This is not for action. Uh, this is for discussion as we move forward. <clears throat> Thank you, Chris. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee, to give you a little bit of background on the um, downtown RFP, as we call it, uh, it was first issued in 2012. Staff has been back uh, three times for updates and to reissue uh, reissue the RFP. It's been a number of changes over the years. We've learned a lot of things since 2012 and and made some adjustments. Uh, really, just uh, depending on on where the market's gone and and things that the city really has been looking for. Um, Back in, um, as, as Chris mentioned, back in November, um, you asked us to come back or to look at some process improvements. And so that's what we have today is um, an application process. Is, is, uh, and um, Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee, just as a, as a point of refresh, the re reason that we do this competitive process is this is located in a redevelopment area. And by state statute, anything that we do has to be done through a competitive mechanism. So it can't just be that somebody with a private building knows how to find Xandon and I. They come in and they can ask for something that someone otherwise would not know how to do if they didn't know community and economic development existed. So what it really does is it levels the playing field for all property owners to be able to bring quality projects forward for consideration. So first we wanted to give you a little bit of background and some of the great things that have happened um, with the downtown RFP that have come forward um, over the years. Um, <clears throat> we've seen approximately $627 million in investment in downtown Phoenix. It's about 2,400 residential uh, units and about 77,000 square feet of commercial. Some of those great projects um, that are some of, uh, I think all of these are underway right now, is uh, the duo on Fillmore would be one great example. It's a 17-story residential building. They're just starting construction. Um, if, you, if you're out there, you'll see it. Uh, the Derby is uh, one that's been a little bit delayed, but they're back on track now. Uh, they are a 19-story residential building. Uh, they're going through some of their plan review and, and that sort of thing at the moment design. Um, X Phoenix is a two-phase project. Um, each phase will have about 300 residential units. Um, and if uh, uh, some people can see it outside their windows right now, that's very much under construction. Very exciting project, only about a block away from here. Um, Battery Lofts is a 278 uh, unit residential project, also under construction at the moment. And then uh, the Link Phoenix is a three phase project. One phase is open, there's people moving in. That is a 30 story tower. And then they have two more coming. Uh, working on the next groundbreaking uh, in the next few months. Uh, be a, a additional 27-story building and a 32-story building. So some great projects have really come out of um, this RFP, and we're really excited uh, to take this to the to the next chapter and, and see um, what what can be next. So the application process. Um, some of the key things that really go into consideration. Some of the the things that um, that that we were looking at when we um, developed this process. We wanted to make sure it was a streamlined process, something that was, was quicker. The, the current process, a little, little bit cumbersome, goes through the procurement process, all of the rules that go along with that. And we wanted something where, where applicants could work a little bit more directly with staff. Still has all of the um, checks and balances that the procurement process has, but gives uh, applicants a little bit more ability to work directly with staff, work directly with uh, council on projects, and, and make sure everything's moving along very quickly. However, we, um, we wanted to include some of the, a lot of the key things that were in the RFP process. So um, one of the more recent updates that we included was 
that they, if there are any existing buildings on a site, they need to tell us what the plan is for that. And that helps us to have an understanding with some of our older buildings, historic buildings, warehouses, that kind of thing. What we know what's going on with that. Another item would be the workforce housing that was just recent requirement that was just recently um, included. Those, those things would stay in the um, application requirements. Um, of course, we want projects coming forward to be consistent with codes, you know, our codes, policies, and plans. Uh, make sure that they're doing what, what everybody has asked for developers to be doing um, within the city. Um, pedestrian oriented, oriented, walkable, multimodal, um, things that we really want to see downtown. So we want these projects to be exciting, robust, and really contribute to the downtown um, environment. Um, be completed quickly. So not just our timeline is quick, but we want their timeline to be quick as well. They, we want to make sure that they have a plan to actually execute um, on these, on these uh, developments. Uh, be supported by the community. So we want the, the developers to be working hand in hand with the community. We would still do our typical outreach and we would ask the developers to do their same outreach that, that um, we have been doing through the RFP. And then of course dem demonstrate that there are public benefits associated with it. So we want to make sure that there are things like the workforce housing or public parking or other things that really contribute to, to downtown. Um, and with, uh, with that, we're available for any questions. Madam Chair, if I might add, uh, based on what Zanon said on being supported by the community, I think it's important for this council to know this isn't taking away any of the public outreach that we do today. Uh, we will still have a, a committee that sits. There will be a, a community panel. There would still be all the community meetings. There would be all the community activity. So none of that's going away. Uh, it's simply that upfront process of the RFP moving more into an application. But all of the back end process would still be there to make sure we're as transparent as we can possibly be. Um, in the workforce housing, it was 10 percent. Am I correct? Madam Chair, that is correct. Um, I have a question regarding uh, giblets. Um, the data that I have been analyzing and looking at uh, is that uh, with the giblets, we're maxed out or we're at, not capacity, I don't even know what the term is, uh, that where a need is is an office space and that the housing is, is, is up and flourishing and the hotel is up and flourishing, but where we're needing now is office space. So go ahead, Chris. Yeah, Madam Chair, you're correct. Our office space really has languished behind the other two um, disciplines here in downtown Phoenix. Our vacancy rate has fallen uh, to about 10% in our office, our office vacancy rate but the product that's left is kind of an older, obsolete product. It's not the product that companies are looking for today. I think a perfect example of the activity we see with Block 23. So they, beautiful, new, creative, open, glass line, big floor plates, it has gone gangbusters in its leasing, just leapfrogging over other product that's available here in downtown. We are in high demand of new office buildings here in downtown, and we're not seeing, we're seeing one or two potentially on the horizon, but to your point, Madam Chair, nothing like we see hotels and residential in the market. So what would you recommend in order to really jumpstart that or really get people, um, I guess, attracting people to, to look at office spaces? Madam Chair, we um, are working as a team, our economic development team, to really, we've been working on that strategy. We, I think we hit all the low-hanging fruit that we had to hit. Okay. When we started working together five years ago, the vacancy rate in downtown was nearly 30 percent. So on a 13 million square foot market, we're down now to about 10, mil, uh, 10 percent or about 1.3 million square feet of vacant space. We're working on how we kind of break that old mantra of what downtown is, of what the, the availability of parking, the availability of these large floor plates, the, the signage of the different things that we're looking at. Madam Chair, we're working on what we could do to really make that encouragement to get those first developers to, to break ground on those next new office buildings. Um, and are strategizing not only within our internal group, but we're 
you know, companies that don't choose downtown Phoenix, they choose another area of the metro. We do an exit interview with them to ask them why didn't, what would have made the difference? Why would you not have chosen downtown Phoenix? And the biggest thing that we found is the, the fear of lack of available parking, the lack of available floor space, but then the misperception about our workforce. Uh, and the affordability of being able to be a, in the market. And so we've, uh, our research department has run some analysis to show that the brokerage community and the site selection community misunderstood the workforce. And we're working on getting that information out mm -hmm. with private sector here in the first quarter. Uh, we're gonna do a big splash of getting out just how robust the workforce really is in downtown Phoenix. Councilman Nakowski. Madam Chair, I think this is the process that's gonna help a lot of those um, office buildings come into downtown. It's streamlining the process. One of the things that I hear over and over is that we have a tenant, but we have to go through this whole process, and then they end up losing a tenant, then they end up losing the project. So having a, an application like this, a process that streamlines it, makes it quicker, easier, I, I believe the opportunity to, to attract more business and office space in downtown is gonna help out. So. Um, I applaud you on this individual way of thinking and let's try to bring in as many businesses as we can. All right. Do we need a motion on this? No, it's just an information, right? Madam Chair, what we had hoped today is we could gather some direction from you. Uh, Madam Chair, what I heard from you is to go back and look at our office space, look at our office, uh, look at our residential, look at our hotels, and come back with a staff recommendation yeah. of what that would look like. Only because I had been just, mm -hmm. I don't know what I was doing, but I was uh, <laughs> looking at data and sitting there going, okay, this is mm -hmm. where we, we, we reached our peak, and now this is where we need to go. I also know that um, downtown, uh, what is it, the downtown uh, Inc., not the downtown Inc., uh, DPI, mm -hmm. and uh, that I had a conversation with them, and they're doing an analysis regarding parking and regarding what, what is needed also. So for me, it would be to be able to have all that information, look at it, analyze it, and then come back with some recommendations as to well, how do we uh, incentivize or leverage what we have. So that's just my thought process. Madam yeah. Chair, so how many different committees would a person have to go through on this process. Madam Chair, uh, Councilman Nowakowski. So th this process, it starts with a, with a panel, and that panel is made up of, it depends, but typically it's always internal staff members as well as members of the community, different stakeholders that evaluate the, they're doing an individual uh, analysis of that proposal and whether or not we'd want to move that forward. So that's the initial kind of analysis and, and check. And then staff begins, assuming that, that they suggest that we move forward and our uh, director accepts that recommendation, then uh, staff begins to negotiate with the applicant and then we would take it to, take the proposal forward through some neighborhood groups. We're not asking for a neighborhood group to necessarily um, take a vote on a, a, uh, a proposal. They can if they do choose to, but it's not a, not a requirement. And then it would just need to go through um, subcommittee and city council. All right, perfect. Thank you. Thank you for the good work. We will see you again. <laughs> uh, item six, federal workforce development activities overview. Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the subcommittee. Joining me at the table, Lissetta Hogans, our Phoenix Business and Workforce Development Board Executive Director under our Community and Economic Development Department, and Quaylen Waller, who serves as our Deputy Business and Workforce Development Director in our Human Services Department. And we're here to talk with you about our Federal uh, Workforce Development Activities Overview. In partnership with the Human Services and the Community and Economic Development Departments, we are responsible for managing the state and federally funded workforce development programs, which are known as Arizona at Work City of Phoenix. I will now turn the presentation over to Lissetta, who will provide an overview of the Arizona at Work City of Phoenix structure. 
Thank you, Marshall. Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee, annually the city um, receives $12.1 million um, through a formula allocation from the Arizona Department of Economic Security by way of the U.S. Department of Labor from the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act of 2014, WIOA or WIOA. We have several acronyms. <laughs> <laughs> Um, the purpose of this funding is to strengthen and improve our workforce system. It's to add high quality jobs and careers and to hire and retain skilled workers. This funding provides no cost services to unemployed and underemployed adults, youth, laid off workers and other population specific initiatives. So Arizona Work City of Phoenix structure, I'm just going to review this a little bit. Um, appointed by the mayor and city council and staffed by the Community Economic and Development Department, the City of Phoenix Business and Workforce Development Board is comprised of up to 25 members um, charged with providing strategic guidance to ensure workforce training and services that are aligned with the needs of Phoenix employers and job seekers. Uh, the Community Economic Development Department is responsible for the design and oversight of our workforce development system. And the Human Services Department is responsible for the delivery of adult career and youth workforce services. That will be discussed later on in this presentation. Within the Community and Economic Development Department is the Phoenix Business and Workforce Development Center that's located off of First Avenue in Van Buren. The Business Center provides workforce development expertise to businesses seeking to expand um, or to come to Phoenix. We are the only city in the region to have an in-house team fully dedicated to workforce business solutions. Quaylen will now uh, provide an overview of the programs the city offers under WIOA. Thank you, Lissetta. Um, Adult Career Services provides a comprehensive array of workforce services, including basic services, such as job searching and resume building, individualized services, which includes career planning, soft skills training, and occupational skills training, and follow-up services that ensure job seekers receive employment retention counseling for 12 months after achieving their goal of employment. Through this program, we serve over 2,500 individuals annually. The Youth Workforce Program is a comprehensive youth employment program serving eligible youth ages 16 to 24 who face barriers to education, training, and employment. Services provided uh, include career exploration and guidance, case management, and support of educational goals and training and internships. Um, these comprehensive services are offered through three contracted service providers, Chicanos por la Casa, Jewish Family and Children's Services, and the Watts Family Maryville YMCA. All of the services discussed today uh, can, are provided at the following locations, and I'm going to turn the presentation back over to Marcelle. Thank you, Quaylen. And finally, we have provided a web link to all of our programs and services for those who may be watching on Phoenix Channel 11. We really want to encourage our community to avail themselves of what we have available through our Arizona at Work City of Phoenix programs. And Madam Chair and members of the subcommittee, this concludes our presentation. We welcome any questions you may have. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, There's a huge dialogue uh, happening within uh, the city uh, regarding we owe a dollars and regarding how we owe a dollars are, I don't know necessarily distributed, but how they're being used, I guess is what I'm saying. There's a collective uh, in the business community along with school districts now wanting to uh, look at we owe a dollars and how we owe a dollars or schooling or uh, being skilled can be leveraged. Um, and I'm not sure if you guys are in those uh, conversations. Uh, and what I mean is sometimes we live in our bubble because I live in a bubble and then I go outside and I'm like, oh my gosh, all this stuff is happening and I'm not aware of it. 
Um, but I have been in those dialogues, I want to say, for the last six months uh, on even the state looking at uh, revamping, reorganizing on how we owe dollars are. I don't know necessarily being distributed or being, or how they can uh, uh, impact more people. So I don't know if you guys have heard that dialogue. Madam Chair, thank you so much for the question. Um, currently on our board, we do have a, a group of individuals that are both business. Our board is made up of 51% business, and any others are nonprofit organizations and community organizations. Um, we currently have a member on our board that is a part of the Maricopa County uh, Community College District. And so recently, he actually educated the board on the fact that the state of Arizona is their Department of Ed is looking to, they're working on our state plan right now. Part of that is post-secondary education and the funding that comes from career and technical education. So those conversations are, are happening at the federal level and they are happening at the local level. Um, one of the things that our board is looking to do is to figure out how do we better interconnect resources, funding that comes from Department of Labor directly, and then the funding that comes from Department of Education. So through WIOA, we have the opportunity to leverage um, funding that comes from career and technical education, as well as funding that comes from adult education. So yes, those conversations are happening consistently on a local level as well. Um, we do have the um, privilege, privilege of having um, someone from the Phoenix Union School District that actually serves as an ad hoc member to our youth committee of our board. So yeah, those conversations are constantly happening. So I'm just saying um, only because I was some very high um, conversations that are being had is that the state is really now looking at uh, making sure, uh, it's not us, because I, I double checked, uh, of compliance, and uh, certain areas are not in compliance, and what's that going to look like, and how does that shift? Um, and so I, I just know I'm talking some high-level conversations yeah. where I'm, I'm also in the midst of learning it, too. Um, and the youth workforce, because of Opportunity for Youth, which I think we're going to change that name again, uh, <laughs> they all fall in this category. So how is that? How are we uh, making sure we're making the biggest impact that we can with the opportunity for youth? Because they have a collective impact that are wanting to step in the WIO uh, world. The dynamic that I understand with WIO, it's just so complicated and people get frustrated with it. Mm -hmm. On the outside world of wanting to help, and once they enter and try, there's all these uh, regulations and, and rules that they get, they get frustrated and they just said, forget it, we're just gonna go out and work with the businesses. So I'm not sure if you guys hear what I'm saying in the sense of you live it. So uh, Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee, so we do have a partnership with Opportunities for Youth. We actually sit on the same floor. Um, we actually have staff that serves on their leadership council. Mm -hmm. um, so they're a, a convener for us. And so um, all of the agencies in Phoenix or in Maricopa County that are providing youth workforce services, they get together at least once a month. Um, so we have an RFP process for our youth contractors. So right now we have three. Um, and so they are all providing services at those three locations that we mentioned, Maryvale, Y, um, CPLC, and then also Jewish family. Um, and so they actually have case managers, um, individuals come in and they receive services there. Um, and so it's, it's an integrated service to mod model. Um, WIOA is very complicated. Um, and so it, it's a, a, a learning curve for the individuals who are contracted with us. Um, our newest contractor, CPLC, has been around for the last um, couple of years, so they're the newest. Mm -hmm. Um, but we meet regularly with our service providers and try to provide them with support. Um, but we're very well connected. Um, we're just, you know, one entity in the youth workforce scheme. Um, and so, but we all try to work together and do referrals. A lot of what OFY does is referring individuals that they meet through their outreach 
to our providers. And so it's really based on the individual's needs um, where they go. Yeah, I, I, I think for everybody that tries to understand WIOA, or the complications <laughs> or the struggles with it, and uh, we provide, I feel that the city of Phoenix provides excellent service and are, are, are keeping up with what is happening and staying within the compliance world. Uh, that's what I'm really happy about uh, in that we're in that space because then it might benefit us in the long run um, if there is a reshifting or change in the future. Um, and then we may also have an opportunity if there's more funding coming down the way, we may be uh, rewarded for uh, the fact that we're we're moving uh, families or adults and and, and children students uh, forward and they're part of the uh, workforce and um, and keep on moving everybody uh, towards their goal so really appreciate your work uh, thank you for uh, the presentation I felt that it was important to to know uh, everybody on this committee be able to do a presentation. <laughs> so uh, thank you for that. Thank, thank you. you. OK. And item 7, Phoenix Convention Center bookings and construction update. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee. Uh, we're here to give an update on some of the projects going on at the Convention Center, as well as uh, talk about some of the goals that we have and give a status. With me are John Chan and Jerry Hopper, and John will begin the presentation. Good morning, uh, Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee. I'm going to start with an update on our construction activity at the Convention Center. So the first thing is our shoring wall replacement project. So as you recall, back in uh, July, we be began uh, work on replacement of a temporary shoring wall uh, at the convention center. So this is a photograph of our site. It's on the north side of Washington Street between 3rd and 5th Street. And this is uh, uh, work uh, from September uh, when the site uh, utility relocations uh, began. Uh, this is an image of the same uh, area from the 5th Street side. And then from this image, you can see uh, the drilling equipment that's actually been delivered on site, and they're starting uh, to drill uh, piers, which will eventually form uh, the permanent shoring wall. So this is the most recent photo. The work is being done over on uh, the Third Street side. And basically what this phase of work involves is drilling 85 piers. These piers uh, go down to a depth of about 75 feet, and they're uh, about five feet in diameter. So it's a, it's a slow process. They do about four per week. So this is a close-up of, of the drilling uh, equipment at 3rd and Washington. Um, the, the, this, so this phase of work will continue. We're about a quarter of the way through the work. Um, this is a view looking east, so they'll work their way uh, back to the east side of the site. And this, work, this phase of work is scheduled to be completed in May, at which time we'll be happy to come and give you an update on progress and next phase of construction. So unless you have any uh, questions about the Shoring Wall project, I'm going to turn it over to Jerry Harper uh, to talk about some sales and marketing activities. We just completed a, a record uh, year in terms of future convention bookings, and I'll turn it over to Jerry. Thank you, John. Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee, uh, thank you for allowing us the opportunity to talk about the work that we do at the Phoenix Convention Center. I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, sales and booking activity, and then I'll also talk briefly about some of the marketing efforts that we have, and then I'll end with a particular initiative on the marketing side that we're uh, excited about. So as a refresh as to how the, uh, the booking uh, team is put together, uh, we work with uh, partners at the Greater Phoenix Convention and Visitors Bureau, also known as Visit Phoenix, um, to book the convention business. And convention business, I'm speaking specifically to citywide conventions. Those are conventions that utilize um, at least two of the three major hotels in downtown Phoenix, being the, the Sheraton, the Renaissance, and the Hyatt. And 14 months and beyond is uh, what we're focused on for the citywide convention business. 
14 months and in, our sales team is solely responsible for the, the filler business that kind of fills in the holes uh, from these large uh, citywide conventions. That's typically where you see uh, s smaller corporate meetings, uh, banquets, receptions, uh, local shows, that sort of thing. So this just gives you an idea of how the uh, activity has taken place over the past few years um, at the convention center. Uh, um, again, this is speaking str strictly to the citywide conventions. And one thing I always like to point out when I show this is when the convention center expansion was complete in 2009, uh, we opened with 68 conventions, citywide conventions. For a while, that was our high water mark. And then, um, as you know, we dealt with a lot of challenges, particularly with the Great Recession, and that affected the uh, total conventions that we had for a few years. But if you look at starting in uh, 2014, you can see we began to trend upwards again um, to recover, and we covered nicely to where now, when we're sitting anywhere, like our new high water mark was last calendar year at 70, and when we're sitting anywhere between the 65 and 70 range, um, then we're performing pretty well as far as uh, citywide conventions are concerned. This slide shows the uh, accompanying number of uh, delegates that go along with those conventions. The fluctuations you see just really speaks to uh, the types of conventions. Some conventions obviously have uh, more people than others. Um, but again, going back to the slide before, um, we're really at a good um, performance level as far as the conventions that have been coming in-house. One thing I want to point out about these two slides is this is showing the results of work that the sales team, again, between the PCC sales team and the Visit Phoenix sales team is the results of their efforts from years prior. Um, citywide conventions, uh, the booking window is usually around three to five years. Uh, so when they book activity, we see the results of that in the future. Um, so some of the groups that we've hosted um, uh, just this past calendar year, uh, you can see we had the uh, Jehovah's Witnesses Convention, 35,000 people in downtown Phoenix. We had some of their events at our building. Um, they utilized Chase Field for their, their big sessions. A lot of people in downtown Phoenix, and they were very happy uh, with the uh, results of their convention. Um, SHIP, so Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers National Convention. I like to point this one out because, as you see, it was 9,000 delegates that came here. They weren't expecting 9,000, um, so it was a, a, um, a lot of a big increase in the number of people that wanted to participate in that. And I think it really speaks highly of the draw of this destination. The Intel International Science and Engineering Fair, um, I love this convention. I have some mixed feelings, uh, mainly because these are really smart high school kids. Um, they, they work on projects that, and, that are anywhere from um, desalinization of water in impoverished countries to a computer program um, that can be applied to a walking apparatus to simulate the Earth's gravity in space. And I think the common theme for a lot of these projects is taking the second place trophy that I received in my high school science fair and reducing it to a participation trophy. Uh, the uh, Geological Society of America was also here. So again, it's 7,000 delegates. Um, American College of Veterinary International Medicine. So those two really speak to the, the science and uh, tech portion that we really like to focus on. So this, when I was talking before about activity that the sales team um, performs, this, this slide here really shows the, uh, the efforts of both of our sales teams. And um, if you see the yellow line that's listed there, that is the, the five-year average of the booking goals that we have uh, for our sales team. And again, when I'm saying booking, I'm speaking specifically to um, contracting events that will be taking place in the future. Um, the, uh, this past year, the fiscal year, 2018-19, uh, we actually set a record with uh, 307,250 delegates that were booked, again, for future conventions. And that was representative of 82 conventions. So some of the future groups that are coming here, um, you can see American Massage Therapy. I want to call uh, close attention to what you see happening in July of 21 and August of 21. So between uh, Kappa Alpha Psi Fraternity's Grand Chapter Meeting, the American Taekwondo Association, and the American Legion, that's 30,000 delegates in the summer. Uh, you know, there's a perception that, that summer uh, business tends to fall off, um, but as you can see here, there is a, a, a community and there, are, there is an industry that does, uh, that's more budget conscious, but does look at Phoenix for some of their events. Um, so 
very busy summer in 21 that we're excited about. I'm unique in July of, of 22, that's 15,000 delegates. That is a, a marketing uh, cosmetics company that um, is bringing their um, annual conference here. Some other um, events that are happening in the future, um, we, we've got Creativation. So Creativation, uh, 7,000 delegates. We've actually got three more years, consecutive years of Creativation coming here in January. One thing I like to mention about Creativation is uh, we attracted that group from Anaheim a couple of years ago. And uh, when they came here their first year, a lot of their attendees were a little apprehensive to, um, uh, to Phoenix. Anaheim is a big draw. A lot of them lived in Southern California. And you know, obviously with Anaheim, you've got Disneyland. That's a big attraction for people to bring their families. So they were a little concerned about how could they um, maintain that energy and that enthusiasm in attending this conference when it was moved to Phoenix. So again, partnering with uh, Visit Phoenix, uh, we reached out to Creativation, uh, contacted and, and um, uh, created, communicated with some of the influencers within that organization, brought them out to Phoenix to experience downtown Phoenix so they could get a sense of, of what there was to do and enjoy. And uh, that really helped to move the needle and they're very excited about that. So I'll talk about some of the marketing efforts that we have um, with our, our new marketing team. Uh, right now we're undergoing a, a, a rebrand, if you will. Uh, we've got a new color palette. We've put together a new uh, brochure that we hand out to our clients that you can see there on the right, and we're also in the process of redoing our floor plans. These, this is collateral that we give to our clients, and um, so far the feedback has been very positive. Uh, paid advertising, this just quickly shows you some of the things that we do on the paid advertising side. Everything you see listed there, uh, the print magazines, uh, these are magazines that are, that are um, looked at and subscribed to by a lot of the meeting planners that we target. Um, the one interesting thing to point out there that's, that was new this past year was um, we had a full page ad in the Milwaukee Brewers uh, home games uh, um, programs that they had for their games. And that was the ad that you see there on the left hand side. The one on the right is the new initiative that I'll talk about at the end of this presentation, which was Canyon on Third. That was a print ad that we used to kind of launch um, this uh, new effort that we have. Um, some other additional paid advertising on the digital side. We do focus a lot more on digital than we do on print. And um, you can see some examples of some of the, uh, the paid search ads that we had, the banner ads that we also have. Um, you can see some of the paid social impressions and engagements and our click-through rate. Uh, one thing that's interesting that we found out, at least from our October report on our uh, digital paid advertising, even though we know that a majority of people um, access our web page and our information through mobile devices, um, the click-through rate was a lot higher on computers, so desktop computers. What that tells us is that the meeting planners that we're targeting are going to our website when they're actually at work and um, doing some of their research for, for, for uh, the facilities they want to bring their events to. I have a question on paid yes. advertising. Mm -hmm. I know that you, you're able to track or see the impressions or the data, data. What do you do with that? I mean, you know they're clicking. How do you then chase? I mean, because you know where it's coming from. Mm -hmm. There's a way to, to, I know in marketing, there's a way to figure out where it's coming from or around. So then who does the chase? Who does the, we know this information, how do we now go to the next level? So Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee, uh, the, what really moves the needle with this type of advertising is when people not only go to our website, but actually contact our staff. The, uh, uh, the end game, if you will, for a lot of the paid advertising is actually receiving a request for proposals for an event. Um, so by knowing that uh, who is accessing our, our information and from where and, and when and how, um, we're able to also find out what works. So if we start a digital campaign and the click-through rate is not as high as we anticipated or would need it to be, then we can know we can shift gears and try a different approach. So that's mainly what we do with that information. And we work closely with our ad agency, OH Partners, uh, to really do a deep dive into the data to find out what the next approach would be um, as far as being successful. Okay. So um, I talked a little bit about social media. 
And uh, the thing with social media for us is uh, a lot of our followers are, uh, we have a lot of people that are local, um, as well as some that, that are not. But we like to use social media to really talk about uh, what happens here in downtown Phoenix. So you can see the page likes we have on Facebook, as well as Instagram. Instagram um, is interesting for us. We have a new campaign that we're going to be trying out soon. But what we've done in the past is kind of use it to welcome guests, like you see when Jehovah's Witnesses were here. Uh, we also like to use it to, um, we pay close attention to what's trending. So when the Face app um, a hashtag was, was very popular, we used that as an opportunity to show what our new uh, food court was going to look like in the future. Um, we also are able to see things like uh, National Cheesecake Day, for example. And we can use that to showcase what our in-house caterer does um, um, by showing her our pastry chef actually putting together the finishing touches on some cheesecake. And it, we get a lot of positive uh, um, input or a lot of positive reaction from that. And that's something that we're going to continue doing as we move into the future. And of course, uh, Fan Fusion, also known as Comic-Con, very big um, visually. So we take advantage of that when that, which is one of our largest annual events, is um, on our property. So Canyon on 3rd, this is the initiative that I was talking about earlier that we're very excited about. Uh, between our west and north buildings is 3rd Street, um, bordered on the north by Monroe, on the south by Washington. Um, frequently, we have closed this street uh, for events and used it as either an extension of exhibit space in some cases. Uh, we've also used it for receptions, uh, for uh, parties for the delegates. Meeting planners are looking for creative ways to uh, engage with their attendees. A lot of times they want outdoor space, especially when they come to this destination. Um, in the past, uh, they've looked at places like Corona Ranch, for example. But then when we realized that we had a gem right here uh, between our two buildings, uh, meeting planners respond very well to that. Because not only do they save the cost in having to bus people somewhere off site, it also keeps uh, their attendees in the downtown footprint, um, which really helps uh, paint that picture for the overall downtown experience. So what I'm going to show you right now is the promo video that we had for Canyon on 3rd, which was when we officially launched uh, Canyon on 3rd to the public as a viable option for outdoor space. <laughs> Again, 80,000 square feet of very flexible um, outdoor meeting space, uh, basically a blank canvas for meeting planners. Um, last year, we had National Cattlemen's Beef Association utilize Canyon on 3rd, actually had live cattle on the street, uh, which is something that's very exciting, along with other uh, farming equipment. Um, one thing I want to point out, we've got a, a couple of events that are coming in the future. The International Association of uh, Fairs and Expos, they're going to be utilizing Canyon on 3rd. I think it's possible that we may see a Ferris wheel um, out on the street. Um, the a golf course superintendent, which is, which is coming um, in the future as well, this was a group that um, has never been to Phoenix. And um, as we know, this destination has a lot of golf courses. Some of their uh, members were, were wondering and very excited at the opportunity to come to Phoenix. And part of the problem was um, exhibit space compared to other locations that they typically go to was a little lacking. We presented Canyon on 3rd as an option to extend their exhibit space, and they're, now they're going to be coming here in uh, uh, January of 24. So with that, we'd be happy to answer any questions. I have uh, three questions. Uh, one is when somebody, I'm going back to the social media piece. Mm -hmm. So when somebody tags or however it pops up, is there a pop-up ad then linked 
So very similar, like I'm on Facebook, I click an advertisement, and then all of a sudden, two days later, that pops up on my Facebook. Yes. Is there, do we do a pop-up or do we send a, an email saying, if you're interested, here are the following steps to take? So the digital targeting campaigns, mm -hmm. which is what you're referring to, we mm -hmm. do participate in that. So if someone has showed some interest in us, um, they will continue to get little reminders um, about the Phoenix Convention Center. Uh, some of the, the, um, the paid search that pops up in their feed is a, again, we, can, we may have a video. I think that was something that we had recently on Facebook. Um, after watching the video, they could also click through directly to our website. That's what I was referring to before while saying that a lot of those click throughs were, were taking place on people's computers. Um, you know, we're, we're looking at on the Instagram side, um, Instagram stories, using that as another opportunity uh, for paid advertisement. If you're over on Instagram stories and you're looking at a few, um, every now and then one will pop up kind of in between some of the ones that, are, that you follow, and that's an ad. Um, so we're looking at doing that as well. And again, the, the uh, C2A for, or CTA for that, so the call to action, is actually getting someone to engage with us by clicking through to our website. And then when there's large groups here, do you guys work with them to create a unique hashtag, or do we have a, a hashtag that then they use along with uh, their innovative marketing and tag it along and do a hashtag piece? So typically, the uh, large groups, they do have someone who manages their social media. And when we have our pre-convention meetings with these groups when they're on property, that's one of the questions we ask, is there a hashtag for your event? And they're very specific about those hashtags. So we make sure that we, we get that and use that in any posts that we have that are related to uh, their activity and, and um, on our property. And the reason why I'm asking you this is because in my other world at Phoenix College, mm -hmm. I work with the marketing person really closely, and she has explained this whole world that I didn't understand. So I was like, OK, let me see if they know what I'm talking about, yes. uh, which you do, which is great. Uh, the other, other, my last question was on the numbers. Who do we compare ourselves to? And are we at the same le le uh, level as the other cities that we compare ourselves to in the sense of how many conventions? So that, that's, a, that's a good question, Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee. Uh, we com when we compare ourselves to other cities, we're typically looking at the other cities that we compete with for the same groups. So cities like Denver, um, uh, San Diego, I mentioned Anaheim before, um, uh, Seattle, uh, Portland, um, Austin, which is another city that we compete with. Uh, so I would have to uh, reach out to some of my colleagues or um, at those other destinations to see what their high watermark or their, their optimal range is for a number of conventions. Um, but like I said, when we're focused on the competition, it's mainly on uh, the, the other types of cities, the other cities that the clients that we're going after to are also sourcing. So as far as how they perform, I could have to, I'd have to do some research to find that out. Could you do that for me? I'm just, I'm, I'm curious if we're, I'm curious if we're performing mm -hmm. at, at the same level or if we're higher, where we are in that sense. Because I don't, in the convention <clears throat> world, I don't know how we make or making sure that we're as competitive uh, as other cities. And I know that by taking a convention away from, that's, that's, that's one way of looking at it, but I'm trying to get a more global sense of it. Mm -hmm. That's just. Another way, uh, Council on how we measure uh, our success is by, you know, just sheer numbers, uh, as well as repeat business, new business, so those are some of the things that we look at. Sometimes it's hard to do an apples to apples comparison directly with another city because some of their metrics are driven by, you know, the amount of contiguous space in the convention center or the number of uh, convention hotels within walking distance of, of, of their meeting space. Uh, and so there's, every city is different. So um, we can do some research into some comparisons, but pretty much every city is different. So we kind of look at you know, the success, successes in terms of, you know, direct spending, number of room nights occupied, and things like that. And Madam Chair, just to, to add, um, one other, just about a month ago, the uh, city of Fort Worth 
uh, put together a team, <clears throat> excuse me, a team. I think they're looking at expanding their convention center. And they came here to Phoenix to actually speak with myself and my colleague with Visit Phoenix uh, to gain some insight into how we do what we do here. Um, and one of the things that, uh, that stuck with me that they said was they chose us because in their eyes, we're one of the cities that's doing it right. Um, so uh, just, just wanted to let you know that that's the perception for some of the cities that are out there about Phoenix. Go ahead. Madam Chair, I actually sit on the um, Visit Phoenix board and um, one of the struggles that we had back in 2010 was the whole SB 1070. We had a <coughs> lot of conventions that were um, canceled because of that, um, that immigrant law that was passed. Um, ever since then, I mean, business is back up. If you can notice that right after SB 1070 was kind of demolished oh, yeah. and they went to court <laughs> and they basically tore it apart. Um, back in 2014, you started seeing the business come back. So a lot of those individuals, because of political reasons, couldn't um, book conventions in the city of Phoenix. But once they've done, once they booked a convention, very happy. Um, well, uh, the plus and the minus that we have is our weather. Um, mm -hmm. During the springtime and the fall, it's beautiful. And the summertime, the magic that um, these individuals have done by booking conventions during the summertime is just amazing. And um, that's one of the, that was one of our weaknesses. Now it's one of our strengths. The other thing is uh, we have a weakness of hotels in the downtown area is that um, we really don't have that many hotels. Thank God for the light rail that could connect us all, all along the light rail um, path where there's other hotels there. But that's one of the other shortages besides um, workforce um, development in downtown Phoenix. Um, we need to really look at um, convention hotels at walking distance from our convention center. I'm not sure if there's anything else, John, do you think we need around our convention center? It's, it's really the, the amenities package, because uh, one of the things that, you know, our partners at Visit Phoenix and Jerry's team uh, sometimes deal with is that perception that there's just not enough things to do in downtown Phoenix, whether it's, you know, dining or shopping or other activities. So that's something that we uh, continue to have to uh, work on. Well, I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, the, the analysis the market of study. the market study and to see what the market study uh, comes about and says uh, and what is needed uh, in that area, in that space, and in the downtown area. Sure. Um, so I'm looking forward to reading that. Uh, really appreciate all your work. Uh, you guys are doing an awesome job. And uh, continue. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, item eight is uh, the League of Arizona Cities and Towns information and update. I know this is the dangerous spot between lunch and our presentation. So, and since he was talking about National Cheesecake Day, I was <laughs> losing my mind a little bit. But uh, we appreciate the opportunity to share with you since tomorrow on the council agenda, you guys have the league as an item. And we wanted to take the opportunity, um, based upon the request from the chairman, to just share with you some other values that the league brings to the city, separate than the regular government relations lobbying efforts and advocacy efforts that we work on, and we, we will touch on them too at the end, but um, we just want to share that and share with you that the League's goals of promoting local self-governance is provided in many ways from the advocacy to legal work to education and technical training and assistance. And today we'll give you the overview of some of the League's major accomplishments and answer any questions the subcommittee have uh, may have regarding membership. And we know that we've talked to all of you one-on-one, -on -one, but this is a great opportunity and forum to just share the value with you. From a financial perspective, the League is involved in issues that can affect municipal finance. The League works to protect cities and towns, share revenues, and their tax base. They regularly convene meetings with the municipal finance departments to discuss and resolve issues that will be addressed by the Municipal City Tax Code Commission. This commission approves TPT policy for all cities. 
Working with the League enables Phoenix to be proactive on issues that may have far-reaching implications. The purpose of the MTCC Commission is to make changes to the city tax code that modify taxable activities, exemptions, administrative procedures, or regulations. All 91 cities and towns have the same model city tax code, and any changes must be approved by the MTCC Commission, which are then adopted by all 91 cities and towns. For this reason, it is critically important that any conflicts and issues with any changes that are going to be addressed with, by the MTCC Commission are addressed by stakeholders early in the process. Being a member of the League gives the Finance Department the opportunity to participate in these early discussions before any changes are brought forward to the MTCC Commission. The League also participates in the City Tax Administrators Council, otherwise known as CTAC. CTAC helps resolve issues regarding TPT collections and issues with the Arizona Department of Revenue. Lastly, the League also provides professional development opportunities and staffs the Government Finance Officers of Arizona Association. This association provides continuing education opportunities for the city's CPAs um, via their conferences and various meetings that they organize. So what is TPT? Tax, I'm assuming a tax. Madam Chair, members of the, uh, the subcommittee, yes, it's the transaction privilege tax. Transaction. And the transaction privilege tax, give me back. Madam Chairman, uh, members of the subcommittee, so so for example, these uh, would be items that are taxable that are put into the municipal city tax code. So like the retail classification okay. would be one of them. Um, the the tax on um, lodging accommodations, uh, things of that nature. So the commission sets forth what items can be um, taxed but the tax rate is what's set by the city. So, so that's why it's important that as a city, we are a participant in these uh, discussions because these decisions are made outside of the city at, this, at, the, at the MTCC commission. Um, so they're the ones that within the, the, the model city tax code put in what are some of the items that are taxed or not. Although as a city, Phoenix, we set the rate. Okay, so what I am hearing from you is that it is important that uh, d just in the tax world, <laughs> in the finance world, uh, it is important for them to be at the table because there's 91 cities that then go and uh, that then dialogue and determine uh, basically we can settle for this tax rate before it goes to MT M FTCC. Or you know that's there's a dialogue that's happening amongst them that they can agree to, and then whatever is submitted to FTCC, they're aware of the fact that the cities have agreed to this. Is that what I'm hearing, Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee? Yes. Yeah, so okay. so while the the municipal tax code commission doesn't set the tax rate um, in in their policy within the the model city tax code, they can set what kind of activities are taxable. So so just for, for example, yeah. um, let's say the this commission decided we are no longer going to impose sales taxes on the sales of all new vehicles. Um, it's just a hypothetical. It would be very important that we as a city are at the table so that we can have the discussions about how much this amount is per year, what, how that would affect our general fund as a city, and we need to be in those discussions at the beginning before they are brought forward to the commission so that we can um, be able to address and, and resolve those issues early on. Okay. Thank you. For the law department, the value of the league can be seen in the two conferences a year that allow staff attorneys to gain continuing legal education or CLE credits. The law list serve the league hosts, which serves as a platform that allows city attorneys to ask questions and share information among themselves. The league adds value also by supporting city's legal efforts with amicus briefs and assisting cities that have um, had 1487 claims against them. Additionally, they issue a new laws report to city attorneys at the end of each legislative session to aid in the implementation process 
and help to run the Arizona City Attorneys Association to provide government law professionals opportunities to interact and for per professional development. The value of the league is also seen in the professional and technical support they provide the city clerk. They host two major conferences a year providing training through and provide training through the Arizona Municipal Clerks Association. They maintain a listserv for the municipal clerks as well to seek out and share information amongst themselves. The league also publishes an election manual guide which serves as a how-to guide for elections and campaign finance and which is updated as state laws change. And along with the manual, the league provides election certification training to clerk staff, which is mandated by state law. Mike. Thank you. And those are major issues. And on the government relations side, they can be even more quantifiable uh, with regard to their advocacy efforts. Protecting the shared revenue uh, from the state for the city um, has an impact of about $541 million annually, which is in, uh, very important for the city's financial stability. There, the league is protecting the, share, the state shared revenue formula. Every year there's people trying to adjust it and tweak it and look at ways to switch that money from one pool to another and the league's number one goal they're fighting every year is to protect that formula which is a agreement we've made as cities years ago and allowing the state to collect our tax revenues and now we have to continue to fight to protect that formula the league is oops what have i done okay there we go the league also successfully opposes legislation to divert her funds um, just last year there was an effort to pull uh, a significant amount of her funds and redistribute those dollars to small cities and towns um, for their infrastructure improvements. The league fought hard despite the efforts of what many of their own members wanted to keep that formula intact because protecting the formula as is is critical for all success of 91 cities and towns. And that was a big impact and kept us in, kept us with additional $1.3 million of HERP dollars that would have gone. We talked about the model city tax code and the impact. We talked a little bit about the example of the autos, but just alone the um, construction sale tax issues to the digital goods taxation issue, which is an ongoing discussion, is big with regard to this. Pension reform, they played a role. I know that Phoenix was a major leader in that, but the league definitely got behind all of that. And we want to talk about the Wayfair legislation. Um, the league was a very helpful partner, and that's the implementation of taxation on the nexus of online goods. So that the big providers of these of things like Amazon, they were paying these uh, taxes to us, but it's the smaller um, entities who sell online weren't. There wasn't a uniform law for them to pa to pay their taxes for those online sales within our nexus, and the league worked very hard with us in. Uh, making sure that it was implemented. We were one of the last states in the country to implement the Wayfair um, laws. And um, working with the Model City Tax Code and retail classifications allowed us to really increase revenue from, right now we're still looking at what it could be, but it's from anywhere from 50 to $300 million because of that implementation. So real dollars, real impact. Um, the league not only adds uh, value via their advocacy, but also through their stakeholder meetings. We talked a little bit about the Airbnb. Just this summer alone at the league's conference, they convened about 15 legislators and neighborhood groups and a bunch of city and town officials to have real discussions about Airbnb beyond where they were at last year. And it was at their conference where the governor announced that he was open to re-looking at the whole Airbnb issue and uh, putting in more teeth to the legislation so the cities can have more control and authority over what's happening. So these are just some of the things we wanted to provide for you as a rough overview of the value of the league and that for tomorrow we would recommend passage and rejoining the league as a member. So uh, appreciate uh, your report. One of the dynamics with me and the league and why I voted to uh, no longer be a member of the league was uh, had to do with 
uh, the first responders, uh, uh, police and firefighters and their exposure to carcinogens and uh, their exposure to chemicals. And in regarding, uh, as we're seeing the rise in the cancer and uh, the league opposed that. And we were uh, in the midst uh, of the fight of really trying to figure out uh, legislation or the I wasn't in the midst, the, the firefighters and those around were in the midst, but they were uh, contacting me uh, constantly to say, hey, the league is fighting against us. Um, so I would like to know where the league is today on that. I know that they put them on the task force, which was a very strategic move, but I want to know where they stand today uh, with our first responders in this fight. So can somebody answer that? Sure. I'll take a stab at that. And also Tom Belshi, the new director of the league, will be at council tomorrow and can answer it more directly. But the league at this point uh, in the ad hoc committee and in their communications have been supportive of the cancer presumption implementation. And in fact, recently, um, if not, I believe today, are sending a letter to city and towns to follow the law as um, the intent was written um, from Senator Boyer. So I think they have um, come around. Uh, the leadership that the city council has provided has helped us, quite frankly, help the lead, uh, league be better leaders on this. And so um, as a council, you guys have provided direction that's really impacting the whole state. And some of the relationship with the league is important for us to be there to pull them in the right direction sometimes as well. And the leadership that Phoenix provides, um, given that you guys, pro the, the decisions that council provides for the leadership to pull the league in those directions is really important. And so it's just important for us to be there to make sure that they're on the path with us as it is for them to be with us. Okay, so okay. Are, will we receive the letter or yeah, who will? I, I will get you a copy of the letter. Okay. My second question is, uh, one of the requests to Boyer was regarding revenue. Um, and the whole intent of creating this task force was to identify, uh, I guess, revenue. Um, are you so, talking about the cost, the, the expenses? Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. Yes. And so is the league re willing to write a letter regarding um, this also includes revenue or cost. There's a cost to this and, and to our cities and, st and towns or I know there's been a conversation. Yeah. Well, and to answer your question, we've provided uh, the Senator with um, expense categories in the, in the, each of the cancers so that they can wrap their arms around what this looks like, actuarials are also looking at it to try to project out what the cost factors can be into the future. And, you know, ho you know, hoping that with prevention activities and programs, the arc trends down. Um, but so we provided that as a city and the league is working, working directly with Senator Boyer to uh, create legislation to look at both statewide prevention programs um, that impacts all 91 cities and towns, as well as looking at a funding source to help offset, if not cover, these costs that the cities and towns will be facing when they're taking care of their first responders. Well, the good, um, the unfortunate, but yet the fortunate, um, is that we have so many of our men and women now facing cancer. Um, as one member that sat on the task force that is now uh, facing it is, is Brian Jeffries. Mm -hmm. And I, I strongly believe that we're going to see more and more of our uh, network uh, going to start down that journey. The only great thing about it is that they're all warriors, and they're warriors in the sense of wanting to change this uh, for anyone that faces this. Uh, in particular in the public safety arena. So um, I'm proud, I guess, uh, 
for for him being one of those warriors that has been championing uh, this from the very beginning and championing uh, the legislation. Uh, at the time, he didn't. He was just championing it for his brothers and sisters, but yeah, now, unfortunately, fighting. he is now fighting it, um, and is an example of how quickly it it shows up. So my prayers out to him. My prayers out to uh, uh, my strength and spirit and prayers to all those men and women in the state of Arizona facing uh, what we're, we're right now uh, pushing for other cities and towns to do the right thing. So really appreciate the uh, presentation. Does anybody have any questions? All right. Thank you. Thank you. I don't think I have any uh, call to the public. Meeting's over. It's the longest meeting I had. I was going to say. <laughs>